Welcome to Easy Elim Learning Simplified. My name is Ruth and today we are going to be discussing the topic acid bases and salts uh, from four topic and our subtopic for today is bases. Previously we talked about acids and also effects of uh, solvent on a solute and especially on acids. So we are going to focus on the different types of bases uh, that are there and also their reactions. And also we are going to look at what happens when you put a base in a polar and an unpolar solution. So first bases, are usually, we usually call them proton acceptor. That is the Brownstead uh, theory. So proton acceptor means the proton ion that is being given off by the acid is going to begin by the base. So when you look at the Arrhenius definition of what uh, a base is, it is a substance that loses or releases OH ions or hydroxide ions. But this was the Arrhenius definition of what a base is. Although it had some weaknesses because it couldn't uh, explain why ammonia was basic, yet it wasn't giving off OH ions. So that's where Bronsted theory came in. So if you look at ammonia aqueous, it gains an hydrogen ion from an acid to form ammonium ion. For example, another base is copper oxide. You see it's gaining a proton to form copper ions in water. So the Bronsted theory is able to explain why ammonia is basic. Although we know also ammonia dissolves in water to form ammonium hydroxide, but you can see the ammonium is being formed first. So an alkali is a soluble base. So there are some bases that are soluble and others are insoluble. So bases that are soluble are usually referred to as alkali. Uh, there are compounds which produce hydroxyl ions in aqueous solution. For example, sodium hydroxide. If uh, it's in solution, it dissociates to form sodium ions and hydroxide ions. When an acid proton uh, reacts with a base or hydroxyl ions in an aqueous solution, neutralization reaction occurs. So we know the reaction between a base and an acid forms neutral solution. So next we look at the strength of alkalis. So alkalis can be grouped as either strong or weak alkalis, just like we grouped acids as strong or weak. So strong alkalis are alkalis that undergo complete dissociation in aqueous solution, yielding a large number of hydroxyl ions. So if you put this uh, solution uh, in water, you'll notice that they're going to dissociate fully. We see they dissociate fully or they give more hydroxyl ions or the highest concentration of hydroxyl ions or they yield a large number of hydroxyl ions. For example, we have sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. These are some of the strongest bases that we have. We also have weak alkalis, they are the ones that undergo partial dissociation in aqueous solution, yielding fewer number of hydroxyl ions or releasing a small concentration of hydroxyl ions. Examples are like calcium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide. So we can test the strength of an acid in different way or of a base in different ways. One of the ways is um, electrical conductivity. So, so the procedure is 50 centimeters cubed of solution of sodium hydroxide solution is put in a beaker and the apparatus as are shown as below. As you can see in the setup, uh, some sodium hydroxide were placed in a beaker and then the setup was made and the anode and cathode were placed connected to a bulb and a battery. So the same test was done for ammonium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide. So some of the observation you notice is um, the bulb will light very brightly when sodium hydroxide and Potassium hydroxide are used as electrolytes, while it still burn, uh, it's it still lights uh, with ammonium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide, but it's uh, it's not as bright as sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide are strong alkalis because they dissociate completely, 
and they have more ions in solution. So if they have more ions, it means that electricity will move through the solution faster and move through the, the conductors faster. If it is few, it means the, like elect, there's less electrical conductivity. That is the reason why, because ammonium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide release fewer hydroxyl ions, it means they have low electrical conductivity. So pH can be used to test the strength of alkali metals. So for example, in our case, uh, sodium hydroxide and ammonium hydroxide, we place them in two separate test tubes, and then in each test tube we add a few drops of the universal indicator. Then the colors are noted and the pH scale is used to check the pH value. So it was noted that ammonium hydroxide will have a pH of 11, color blue. Calcium hydroxide will also have a color blue pH of 10. And as you can see, um, for sodium hydroxide to potassium hydroxide, the color are purple because they are very strong. And you can see the pH is very high. So another um, thing to remember is when we, when we use the pH scale, it tells us the acidity or alkalinity. alkalinity. The same case we used with acids, you're able to tell a specific acid is strong or weak. So for alkaline solution, their strength increases with the increase in pH. So the look at the pH, so you can see from uh, pH of 8 to pH of 14. This is this alkalis, this side is alkalis. But the bigger the pH, the stronger the alkali. So it means they have, as we move across, it means as we increase the pH, they have more hydroxide ions in solution and less of hydrogen ions. So also remember the color, we talked about this in form 1. So the more alkaline a uh, substance is, the deeper the color. So you can see from pH of 8, we have like a green, blue like color, and then we go to purple. And as you move across uh, from 8 to 14, you can see the color is deepening. So next, you're going to look at the effects of solvent still on uh, substance. In this case, ammonia in, in acids, we looked at the effects of hydrochloric gas on methyl benzene and water. So for this case, you're going to look at ammonia. So ammonia solution is prepared by bubbling a ga the gas from a generator to a methyl benzene and into water in separate uh, beakers. The solutions are each divided into three portions and tested with litmus paper, universal indicator, and conductivity. So you can see uh, ammonia being bubbled in water, the one being bubbled in methyl benzene. So the test was done, and as you can see, these are the observations for the test. So you can see the dry litmus paper, uh, the red litmus paper turned blue in ammonia, the one that was bubbled in water, but there was no effect with the one that was bubbled in methyl benzene. And then the universal indicator turned purple, the one that was bubbled in water but remained green, which is the neutral state, and the one that uh, was in the middle benzene. For conductivity, the one that was in water was a poor conductor, meaning it conducted but not so much, but the one that was in methyl benzene did not conduct at all. This tells us that when ammonia dissolved in water, it changes into molecules, it dissociates to form ammonium ion and hydroxyl ions. The hydroxide ions are the ones that causes it to have the alkaline properties. So you can see how polar ammonia is. So water is also polar, so it would attract itself to the polar water molecules and then dissociate in the process. So since ammonium hydroxide is a weak alkali, it dissociates partially, leaving fewer hydroxide ions and poor conductivity. Uh, ammonia gas in methyl benzene exists as a molecule, so it's already a molecule, but in water it dissociates, but in methyl benzene it doesn't. Remember, methyl benzene is nonpolar, and we've just said that ammonium is polar. So it exists as molecule without free ions, 
hence no alkaline property and there's no electrical conductivity. So let's do this one question and then conclude the session. A solution of ammonia in methyl benzene has no effect on red litmus paper, while a solution in ammonia of ammonia in water has explained this. So we just said that ammonia dissociates in water to give ammonium ion and hydroxide ions which turn the red litmus paper blue while ammonia in methyl benzene remains as a molecule thus lacks the hydroxide ions to turn the litmus paper. So that's the reason why. Make sure if every time you're explaining your answers, you make sure you explain both sides. Don't just say explain one and then say it and then say which is opposite the other. Explain both sides in full. Do not leave anything hanging. So that's it. Let's uh, see you in the next session as we look at the details now of um, bases. You're going to look at the different types of bases and their properties. See you then.